And Chris, I just want to pause it for one second. Yeah. And sure, go ahead. It's Mark Stubb. I'll be introducing myself in a second, but we'll be start stopping the video partway through uh, because we, the introductory part is really uh, helpful to give some background. And it's going to end in a bang. So when you see the explosion, that's when we're going to stop the video and it gets into some stuff. I'll talk a bit more about that later, but it'll end in a bang and then I'll start my show. Sounds great. Okay. Listen to me, people. I'll tell you what I found. I found the changes, oh, those changes keep the world going round. Yesterday, today, and when you wake up next morning Long before the inland waters Were traveled by a man The great lakes were being created By the glaciers on the land Satisfy You must be told again The Great Lakes haven't always been So look about you carefully And realize that what you see Will not remain Will always change And if you could just leave today And travel back to yesterday Would what you see still be the same? Would what you see still be the same? thousand years ago today the glaciers were going away the lakes did remain the lakes which always change but if you could leave yesterday travel back another day would what you see still be the same would what you see still be the same that nice you're up on ice a mile thick 
and moving slow. By the hair, hold her hand and form a square. I'll tell a story as we go, but don't forget to do si do. Don't let go. Long time ago, in olden days, the Great Lakes started in this place. It started quiet, it started slow, but watch and see the Great Lakes grow. Alaman left. Then one day the ice age came, lots of snow, not much rain. The weight of the ice made the land go down, scraped at a hole in the middle of the ground. Alaman right. The rock did scrape, the ice did move. Pretty soon, to tell you the truth, everyone was beaten. Time to the old square dance in two, four time. Do si do. Then one day, an eventful day, the sun came out, decided to play, and after a while, decided to stay and up and melted the ice away. Easy now, hold your partner. When the sun came out that day, the mighty glacier moved away. The consequences they did make the first in genuine Great Lake. Now this story happened again and again. Last time it happened was way back when, ten thousand years ago. Today the very last glacier went away. Bye bye. Now the water coming in has to go somehow, and those days weren't the same as now. The water then was draining north, and nowadays it all goes south. How come? How come? Now swing your partner round and round. Bow to your partner. It's all over now. When the weight of the glacier moved away, the land did spring back up again and cut off the flow of the water north and made it go instead to the south. When you travel on the and you think it's going fine Just remember you are bouncing Like a tennis ball through time When you travel the great lake waters You can see far and wide the traces of that glacier on its prehistoric ride. Da -da 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 -da
Well done, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for um, to Chris and Lou for allowing us to run that film before the show. Uh, it's a great background to this uh, this talk that I've put together, and it's just a great um, trip down memory lane. I, that's a, one of my favorite old documentaries from way back when. And just as, as an aside, a lot of those sh shots were taken in provincial parks, nature reserves, and uh, areas that have become areas of natural and scientific interest for the earth science features. So the whole story of these glacial uh, remnants uh, is actually told in a lot of our protected spaces around the province and some that are earth science ANSIs right now. Um, anyways, I love, I love that film. And actually you can get it free, free through the National Film Board and it goes on to get into environmental matters uh, afterwards as well. So uh, thanks again for uh, inviting me to talk uh, today. Uh, I think I've been to the Hamilton Naturalist Club to give a talk uh, way back when, I think in the 80s, when there was a big effort to try and uh, keep back its woods from being logged. And I was part of a tag team with Kevin Cavanaugh, Steve Varga, Mary Gartshore, making it, I think, to pretty much every naturalist club in Southern Ontario. Uh, now, uh, the Na Nature Conservancy of Canada acquired the property, and now it's surrounded by large other protected areas. So lots happened over the last while. Um, and now I'm, I'm working for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And uh, my uh, interest in this project kind of came from a general interest in, in physiography and, and carrying Chapman and Putnam's physiography of Southern Ontario around with me just as a naturalist. But then um, more recently, we got interested in investigating the, the, the biodiversity side of the Lake Iroquois Plain. Um, so there's some research related to that that got me intrigued. And then I've just kind of got really intrigued about the whole uh, lake and its history and what, what's left on the landscape now that we all are, are seeing, or, or some haven't seen, and now hopefully have a chance to, to see it better with this story put around it. Um, so a bit of a... Uh, caveat to begin with. I'm not a geomorphologist or geologist. Um, I, I've, I feel like I'm kind of showing my stamp collection because I put together lots of bits and pieces of information from all over to help tell this story. And I uh, hope, uh, hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'm, it's got a direct connection to folks in the Hamilton area for sure. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, we'll uh, roll with the presentation. Okay, we're over here. Slide show from the beginning. Here we go. Okay, just want to confirm that you can see that. Chris or Lou? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, so I'll, I'll hide myself here. Well, um, it is, this is a, a feature that many in Hamilton uh, and probably all the naturalists are quite aware of. Uh, has prominent uh, landscape effect in the Hamilton area, but also right around uh, Lake Ontario. It's kind of like a big bathtub ring that uh, has connected you to many places right from New York right over to uh, Prince Edward County. And this uh, presentation, a bit about uh, how it was all created and, and a bit of a tour around the lake as well, and I'll talk a little bit about conservation at, at the end. I will put a plug in for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. I know there's probably a number of supporters um, on board today. So thank you very much for your support. And I know we par partner with a lot of groups as well. And it's a very good chance we partnered with the Hamilton Naturalist Club on, on projects in the past. Um, we, I work in central Ontario, but we do work right across the country. Uh, and they did a recent tally of the acres that we've, we've uh, helped to protect with support from private donors foundations, corporations, uh, and government as well. So with lots of help, and, and uh, I'm, I know that uh, there are folks on the line today that have, have been helping to us, helping us. So thank you very much for your support. Those dots on that map uh, represent some of our focal areas, areas that we target for our um, conservation work. You see this spread across the country. And we used to do work much more, um, what, what do you say, sort of, uh, not random, but opportunistically, where there is an opportunity or a need to, to protect a space, we raise the private funds that help to secure these lands. Now it's done a much more strategic way to have a bigger impact at a landscape level. And we recently, or within the last 10 years or so, did an investigation of those places in Southern Ontario that have the highest biodiversity values or scores from a, this is actually from a federal government perspective. So Environment Canada, uh, teamed up with NCC 
to investigate in the mixed wood plain or southern Ontario off, off the shield, which areas had the highest biodiversity, uh, highest threat um, from migratory bird habitat perspective, uh, fish habitat, wetlands, species, et cetera. And the dark area around Lake Ontario, uh, Lake Iroquois Plain, and that larger blob to the northeast, the Napanee Plain, came out as the top ranked area in terms of biodiversity. Um, so that was an eye opener, um, not for, for some being the coastal wetlands are tremendously diverse, et cetera, but uh, for many people, it's a highly, highly, the Lake Iroquois Plain, highly populated, very densely populated area, but it's a landscape that people don't relate to as the Lake Iroquois Plain. Maybe they relate to it, they live near Lake Ontario or Southern Ontario, but it's a landscape that's chock full of people, but they don't really know it as a landscape. And that was kind of the part of the motivation to put this little story together. As I say, and this is, I think this is the end of the Humber River someplace. There's so many people, but it's not that people can't say, oh, I live on the Niagara Peninsula, or I live on the Rocky Mountain foothills or the Bruce, Bruce Peninsula. So Lake Iroquois Plain is probably Canada's most densely populated landscape, but probably I'm, you know, hidden in plain sight is sort of the uh, way I looked at it. Um, so this so presentation will talk about what the lake was, where, how it came and went. Um, a road show, basically around the lake, and then talking again about conservation ideas and not just a uh, road. I, I gave this talk at Darlington Provincial Park, and imagine a talk about geomorphology and glaciers when there's half the kid, people in the audience are kids. So I incorporated a character from that National Film Board um, film, and you'll see Jacques Larocque showing up from time to time, and that's where he came from. Uh, and I, I decided to keep him in because I think I just like him. So as, as I don't have to tell as much about the story about the glaciers, um, but they did you know, come and go. And the last time they left, uh, they left behind Lake Iroquois. And actually you did see a bit of an image of that on as uh, the lake street or the ice retreated in that, that animation. So that was about uh, 13,000 years ago, approximately. And depending on where you were in, in the province, et cetera. Um, and if at the, at the time before it uh, drained away, and we'll talk about that, this is sort of the extent of it. And it actually included even Rice Lake, uh, right up into the, the south of um, in New York State, et cetera. And this was time of the glaciers. This was prehistoric time. Um, and it was a, a real uh, tumultuous time. I guess the, the term being used it has a chock full of catabatic winds. So big cold winds were blowing off the glaciers, huge waves. And those kind of uh, powers helped create that uh, Iroquois bar that is so famous in the Hamilton area. But to go back from a biology perspective, uh, this is one of my few wildlife shots in the presentation. Uh, this is the time of the muskosk and the, and the mastodon. Caribou were here um, as well. Um, and uh, I went, actually not too long ago, the, there was a show at the RBG and I had to take some pictures of these because this is our chance to learn a little bit of wildlife in this presentation. The, the difference between the mastodon and the mammoth. And you see that on the left, uh, on the top, is the mammoth. It has a much more prominent sort of head, as you can see, maybe different tusks. And the, below is the, the mammoth, or the ma mastodon, with these teeth. They're, they're very different. So the ones on the top are for the mammoth. And they're a green kind of seed eater, kind of grinder, like a deer. And the bottom was more of a cruncher and biter of, of twigs and seeds and nuts and that sort of thing. So the mastodon was more of a forest dweller where the mammoth at the top was more of a, of a seed area, more from the open plain uh, and that sort of open area that, that was also around after the glaciers retreated. But both of these species have bones have been found in the Lake Iroquois shoreline and during various excavations. So it was a time of wildlife and, and uh, these fellows are gone, but there were, you know, picture birds and fish and everything that were still around a living landscape like that. Eventually, as you saw in the film, uh, the ice pulled away and it did change the, the nature of that lake greatly. I got these slides from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute who did research on the history of the lake and what, it, what happened when it drained away. At one point, it drained south along uh, the Mohawk River Valley down into the Albany River and then down into the Eastern Seaboard. And you notice the ice sheet pulling away to the north and east. Eventually, uh, and, and if some of you know that area to the south of New York, there's a big upland there, the Adirondacks. Um, 
you know, good hiking mountainous area, but it does have this St. Lawrence Valley in between it. And then we've got our Canadian Shield to the north. Eventually, the ice pulled away at a spot called Covey Hill. It's actually in, in uh, Quebec. And actually, NCC has a nature reserve now, of all things, just by chance, is because it's got a spectacular wetland left over in this area that I'll be talking about in a sec. So eventually, picture the ice pulling away from the edge of a hill, and it created, it opened up this great valley. And that ice, uh, that valley, the water would drain down. It was far lower than this, the Mohawk River was. So I'm not sure if you, some of you remember having these inflatable circular pools in the, in the backyard, and you play there as a kid. And then your big brother would come and step on this inflatable you know, side to the pool and it would all drain away. That's kind of what happened in this circumstance. Um, it drained away a very, very, short, very short period of time. The, the lake was around for about 500 years at its maximum, and it had different levels uh, over time with different names and so on. Um, but it was around for that period of time, creating the, the shoreline that we see. But it didn't take long for it to drain out, and it blew right down the Hudson River Valley, blew massive. Uh, stones and, and actually bones of, of um, walrus actually were, were found blown out in, under the sediment into the into the seaboard um, and it had a you know, massive massive impact on that valley. Actually it's called the you've, you've probably heard of these you can see videos of them now they're called a glacial out, oh there it goes glacial outburst flood or Yoko Slope, an Icelandic term so a, a mammoth torrent of water you know tearing down that valley. Now, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute was kind of interested in it, not, just, not only from the you know, geomorphology perspective and the, and the hydrology, but its impact on climate, actually. Um, so here it is, kind of the Mohawk River Valley, and actually blew right through a moraine at the bottom, right near the lake, or near the sea, that actually that is now Long Island. So actually, the, the draining of Lake Iroquois helped to create a Long Island in a way. So much water drained out so quickly that it seemed to have had an impact on, glo on global temperatures. So not, not, a, not a huge amount, but enough that it was uh, documented in ice and, and other, other, play, other ways that they've done the research to track down. And it reminded me of this story, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, which is a uh, science fiction film. Some would say well, it is quite ridiculous, but the premise is uh, global warming has melted the Greenland ice caps. It all drained, this fresh water drained into the sea and it cut off the Gulf Stream and then things went instantly cold. Yeah, you know, crappy movie in a way, but that was in a way what happened with this uh, particular draining of, of cold, fresh water into the, into the ocean. And there have been other effects like that. Lake Agassiz, some of you know, um, had a much bigger impact, but this is, certainly had an impact draining, you know, coming right from your, your shoreline there. So as the lake drained away, it was it became much lower than currently Lake Ontario, but eventually, as you saw with the isostatic rebound, land rose, it cut off the flow, and this is now more or less our current Lake Ontario, leaving behind above it uh, another shoreline from the previous lake, and in between is the Lake Iroquois Plain. Now, I, as I mentioned, became aware of it through uh, just being fascinated with this physiography of Southern Ontario. Um, Chapman and Putnam's book is talking about these enduring landforms, you know, eskers, drumlins, uh, old sandbars, etc., left, left behind. And you can see it on this uh, slide the yellow and blue are on the Lake Ontario coast. The yellow is sand plain, blue is clay plain, and that red line is the shoreline. Um, and it, sometimes the sand um, shoreline, sometimes gravel bars, um, but it's very prominent and quite distinctive. And you can, you can trace it, you know, there are many places you can go and, and seek it out and you can see it here. Actually, I'm just doing a line to kind of show where it was. There are remnants of it left behind. It's this little bump compared to say something like the Niagara Escarpment, but still enough of a change that it has impacted land use and, and a lot of it has remained somewhat natural. Here's another example here. Uh, often because the shoreline itself was flat uh, sand or gravel, it became a prime location for uh, trails, walking trails, Aboriginal trails, for example, Indigenous people used to use those trails, but then eventually roads and railways. A lot of roads and railways were originally built uh, right along that shoreline because it was so easy uh, to build upon. Here's uh, another example of a map. This is actually from Steve Varga, who mapped out the old shoreline. Steve Varga, for example, or just to 
as an aside, works for the Ministry of Natural Resources. He's an ecologist. He may have talked to the club once before. He was uh, a key person in actually defining the line that identified the Oak Ridge as moraine officially. So the Oak Ridge is moraine official boundary, he helped create it. He's also fascinated with the shoreline. This is from one of his maps where he uh, marked this, this shoreline. And, and it's it's been intriguing to try to track down some of these locations and, and see you know what, where, what may have been there in the past. So uh, that's what we'll be doing now. So we're being, uh, doing a bit of a road trip around the lake and see what those features are that we can see around that shoreline. So um, basically, it's like the Lake, Lake Ontario shoreline, except you know further inland and without the water right next to it. So there's another example there. There are shore bluffs and cliffs, sand beaches and gravel bars below. And intermingled with them are spits, lagoons, islands uh, left behind. Actually, Lake Iroquois was, had many more islands than Lake Ontario did. And we'll talk about some of those. Oh well, yeah, and Highway 401, if you've ever driven by, you know, headed east by Coburg, that hillside, that ridge, beautiful forested ridge, um, beautiful in the fall, that's the old Lake Iroquois shoreline. So there's a good example of 401 built right on that old um, shoreline. Now, Lake Iroquois Plain itself is that land between Lake Iroquois shoreline and Lake, Ir Lake Ontario shoreline. So the sand plain and clay plain, you know, great places for agriculture, as, as you know. And there's some amazing valleys and ravines and how they were formed was quite interesting and affected by uh, the, the rate of drop of Lake Iroquois Plain. And we'll talk a bit about that. And Lake Ontario coast itself is actually part of Lake Iroquois Plain. And if you look at this, this is Bondhead Bluff south of Newcastle. It's very easy to get to off to Highway 401. Very, it's an antsy. Um, I encourage you to go. It's like a Scarborough Bluff that people really haven't discovered. It's a fantastic place to visit. This picture, this, this is what the Lake Iroquois shoreline probably looked like, you know, 13,000 years ago with, you know, there would be ice and icebergs and so on, walrus flying on the shore. But now that was kind of what it would have been like. And now it's all been vegetated and disturbed in various ways, but that could have been what it like, looked like at the time. Now, when the, uh, at the time of the lake and when it uh, retreated, for example, it was a living landscape, as I mentioned, with wildlife, with fish and people. And, and paleo Indians uh, did travel the shore and they hunted and fished in the area right from the very time of the glaciers. And there's evidence, all kinds of archaeological evidence of, of indigenous people or uh, paleo Indians use of, of uh, shorelines in particular, uh, and this and that one as well. And uh, they actually managed the landscape. Lake Iroquois Plain was not this wilderness untouched by people. It was highly occupied and managed by indigenous people. And if you ever want to read an interesting account of some of that, actually a lot of that history, uh, I recommend John Riley's book, The Once and Future Great Lakes Country, uh, written about 10 years ago or so. Amazing, uh, a fascinating account of how, how many people, how many indigenous people lived there and what, how they managed the land for crops, uh, for firewood, uh, for wildlife, et cetera. So, and, and indigenous people remain connected to, to the land there today. So here, uh, for example, like even some, some kind of reference to that, uh, Spadina is actually an Anishinaabe term, uh, Ishpadina, a place on a hill, and, uh, and Lake Iroquois is named after um, the Haudenosaunee people, who at the time were, they were called the, the Iroquois people, uh, and they were using the trail along that shoreline. I'll talk some more about that later on. So this is right near, uh, well, Spadina, Davenport area in Toronto. So uh, let's do a little bit of history here. Uh, this is a drawing about of the time when uh, Lieutenant Simcoe, Governor Simcoe, uh, was first mapping out a, a way north uh, to have a safe place to escape from or get away from the Americans if need be, but also to have a road into the wilderness. He first encountered the Lake Iroquois shoreline, the Oak Ridge and Rain, et cetera, et cetera, before he got up to Lake Simcoe, which he named after himself. He named a lot of things after his family. Um, but really the first person to really identify it was a fellow named Thomas Roy, uh, engineer and geologist around 1834. And this is the size of Toronto at the time, uh, very small. Um, and they were building, they had planned to build, the local businesses wanted to build a railway north. Uh, to bring wood, uh, food, uh, move goods and, goods and services around. And he was hired to do the job. So he was a surveyor. And this, uh, this is what kind of looked like this is 1875, you know, so very similar, way off in the distance you see, you know, Toronto. 
and this is at Spadina uh, and Davenport area as well. He would have encountered this bluff while trying to draw or create a, a railway line for these steam locomotives. So this hill, this hill was impassable at the time. Uh, so he had to find a way, and he did eventually find a way around. And I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling that's where the up train goes now up to the airport. I think that's the route he selected. Ultimately, though, um, something went wrong, and the funding didn't come through, there were politics, and that, you know, Toronto's first public <laughs> public uh, railway um, was, was shut down. So long history of, of, of railway problems or things not going uh, according to plan. Anyways, so, but he did map this, and he mapped it really uh, closely, and he, as a geologist and engineer, he surveyed it very, uh, to the, to the very great, great amount of detail. And we, we don't know how he made this connection, but he actually wrote about it and sent it to a fellow named um, Charles Lyle. And this fellow on the, the group on the left isn't Thomas Royce. This is an old picture of some surveyors. Uh, that photograph is a foot of uh, Markham Road in the, or, yeah, in the Scarborough area. And Charles Lyle in London received a paper from Thomas Roy about this shoreline. So he wrote all about it, he measured it all. And they, at the time, it, there, people were hypothesizing about the rise of all the Great Lakes. What was it before? Was it part of a sea? Was it, uh, was it, a, you know, was it part of the ocean or not? Uh, where, how, how these different shorelines were created? Uh, what were what was at play, etc. And he sent it to, to to Lyle, and Lyle, as many of you know, uh, was the fellow who helped introduce Charles Darwin's uh, theory to the to the scientific community. So he, this Thomas Roy guy had connections. Um, so so Lyle did kind of read that. So he's he, one of the pioneers. Was this fellow in London as well? Kind of helped to share the word about it. And at the time, Great Lakes geological history. It's kind of like the Galapagos you know, in terms of, of geology, how things are working. There was lots of interest, lots of papers, a lot of research about how it was formed and the connection to uh, Niagara Falls, for example, and talk about that as well. Now, so for those who are kind of fascinated with this story, uh, I guess I kind of that way, and you, you, you had a team of people, your collector cards, for example, the Lake Iroquois pioneers, Charles Lyell is one of them. Sanford Fleming, Sir Sanford Fleming actually did some survey work of the shoreline as well. Uh, Gilbert, did a lot of the mapping on the New York side, all about the same era. And J.W. Spencer who was a fellow who actually named it Lake Iroquois after the Haudenosaunee people who at the time were mostly using those, uh, the shoreline as, as portage routes, et cetera. And I was talking to Chris earlier, Spencer, I think he's from the Hamilton area. And I think Spencer's Creek might be connected with, it, with that family somehow. So anyways, so Spencer was involved with this as well. But the, the person who really had the biggest impact on telling the story at the time was A.J. A. Uh, a. Coleman, who was uh, a teacher at University of Toronto. University of Toronto. Uh, actually had an outpost at, in Coburg. They had a Victoria College, I think it was called. But um, so he did his geology work. Here, here's him leading a tour um, for mostly guys. There's a couple of women in there and love to hear their stories about how uh, what they were involved in, what, what they had done. But, he did some amazing mapping. Uh, and this was, yeah, I'm calling the captain of the team. Um, he turned the sort of general mapping into something much more detailed. And then even more so uh, where he went out to, uh, he had summers off as, a, as teachers do at the time, did at the time. Um, and at the time when there weren't a lot of roads, weren't a lot of motorized vehicles and there wasn't GPS or GIS, he created this really exquisite drawing of the Lake Iroquois shoreline and, and lake. He had support from others. Like I think he had some data from Gilbert, from Spencer, et cetera, to create this version. And it really is a beauty you know, work of art. Uh, here's some of the detail in Northumberland County, for example, when we were talking about a uh, number of islands. Um, some of these were islands and lagoons and so on. Uh, the shoreline further north, further north. But this area around Prince Edward County was underwater at the time as well. So, Let's take a tour around the lake and see some of these different features that were mapped um, at the time. And there are much more detailed maps now, but I just love that map because it was it was actually, some of you recall, uh, I call it the Laurentian period of mapping when you used to have Laurentian colored pencils. And that's how they used to map. Anyways, um, it was a, it's a beautiful work of art. So let's go around the lake and see some of those features that are in the Lake Iroquois Plain left behind after Lake Iroquois drained away. 
And I want to take you to a spot in the Mohawk Valley, Mohawk River Valley. Um, and notice out the map with all those uh, you know, different colored properties. Those are all protected lands owned by Nature Conservancy, Department of Environmental Conservation, et cetera, all focused in this area. And it's like a mini, or like, like, a, like a Pine Ridge Provincial Park in a way, but very sandy, because that was a sandy um, outflow, out, the water's flowing out the valley and sand was deposited in sandbars, et cetera. They became high and dry, and they became uh, favorite places for interesting species like uh, lupin uh, and, and uh, you know, frosted elf and butterfly is there, et cetera. I think we've got our guy going down the river here. Model, yeah, frosted elf and model dusky wing, I think is there. So it's like, in a way, the sandy dry habitats that you'd see on the dunes uh, in Pinery, that sort of thing. So that was that whole landscape is like that. And a lot of it is recognized as significant and it is protected at this point. So heading around from Syracuse area, for heading further to the west now, oops, sorry, the, uh, that Old Ridge Road, um, the same phenomenon on the south side. Uh, and I think it would have been the Haudenosaunee people there who were using those trails, those old, old railway trails, and then eventually became used by uh, pioneers and, and then later roads, et cetera. So that road follows that shoreline quite closely. Eventually, you're getting closer to, to uh, the Niagara River there on the west. And you actually can see, uh, even with the naked eye, I sometimes use a magnifying glass, you see that sort of darker green uh, area. That's the shoreline. And a lot of these um, shoreline areas have uh, springs that feed, uh, that are emerge at the base of these, uh, the slope, the hillside into the sand and gravel. And there are a lot of the wetlands actually that are protected and, and are right at the base of that shoreline. They're very closely connected with the hydrology uh, related to that the shore feature. So now we made it to Niagara River. And uh, this is the, uh, oh, where is this location? Oh, yeah, this, this is actually the outlet of the Niagara River. This is where Niagara Falls began. So the Lake Iroquois shoreline came right up to the edge of this Niagara escarpment here. And at the time it was flowing over into Lake Iroquois at the time, 13,000 years ago. And it took all that time to erode away back to the current place where it is right now. And every geologist in the area interested in the story was fascinated with that creation of uh, the falls and they could actually document how long it took to get to that point. And that helped them to you know, tell the story. Um, so that location is sort of the beginning of Niagara Falls, and from there we go into the Niagara Peninsula. Well, that's Brock Monument, by the way. Um, actually, played a role. That whole ridge played a role in this in the World War of 1812. And at first, I think I say send our man over the falls here. So here we go. Give him a chance to have his little go there. Jolly good. Now we're into uh, the Niagara region. And I was mentioning um, earlier well, to, to Chris that uh, there, and I've forgotten the fellow's name, um, but there, uh, he was at Brock University, a fellow who was a soil scientist, and uh, he specializes in, in the ter terroir or the, sort of the relationship with soil climate uh, to growing of grapes in the Niagara Peninsula. And many of the vintners, all, probably all of them, know a lot about the shoreline because it has big influence on what they can grow, where they can grow it, and when they can grow it. And so you see, again, the blue is a clay plain, the yellow is a sand plain, and then you see the shoreline. A lot of times it's butt up right against the Niagara Scar, but sometimes it's not. Oh, and actually one of the locks on the uh, well on the canal that actually takes boats up that shoreline uh, ridge. That, so it's, it, it's not just to get over the escarpment, actually one of those locks is right at that Lake Iroquois shoreline. Here's a small bluff in, in Niagara. Niagara is not known for a lot of natural areas, um, what they have is quite significant, and some areas are actually the, this old shoreline that's that's uh, that's left behind. And here, oh, here's these. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, the vintners were quite aware of this. So below uh, the shoreline has certain growing degree days, and then there's actually the slope itself. And then the bench, they call the bench, is between the shoreline and the Niagara escarpment. And then you see these wines called various thirty bench, top bench, hidden bench. The bench is formed between Niagara Scarbent and that Lake Iroquois shoreline. So a very distinctive area for, for growing grapes, et cetera, and all tied to the geomorphology that was left behind after the lake was gone. If anybody goes, well, I used to go hawk watching uh, at Beamers, the conservation area. Um, if you look to the east, 
you can see the Niagara Escarpment and actually the shoreline for a lot of the time is right up against it. But there is that, uh, another area, that's one of the benches. You see on the, on the upper horizon, the darker area, that's actually one of those benches. So it's actually the Lake Iroquois shoreline that, that created that bench. So that, like, remember I showed you the picture of Bond Head, the water would have been uh, up there lapping against the shores, creating that bluff in that old glacial tilt. So heading further to the west, uh, 20 Mile Creek is one, just one example of the many creeks that were created when the water uh, you know, drained away, it created this exposed very quickly, uh, this sort of unconsolidated clay and other sub substances that any small creek or water body could create a quite a significant valley. So now you have a lot of these small creeks, I know one near Wesleyville, for example, in a great valley that you think, how did this creek create this valley? And that part of it was, was creating these uh, kind of rivulets through very soft, unconsolidated uh, sediments like that. And finally, we get to the, the Great Bar, Lake Iroquois Bar. And I was, it was my honor to meet a fellow once. Um, I gave a talk at the RBG about this, actually. His name is John Terpstra. And some of you probably know him. He might be a member of the club. He wrote a book called Falling Into Place. And he calls it the book is what happens when one person becomes completely enamored of the landscape in the city where he lives. And he's totally fascinated with this, the Lake Iroquois Bar and the shoreline. And I'll just read you, read you a piece from, if you don't mind. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I can send the reference to, you know, so you have it for, for, um, for buying, perhaps in the future. Okay, so the, way, the way he puts it. When the ice block melted, the level of Lake Iroquois quickly fell as water slipped out of the side door of the St. Lawrence Valley. It was during this geo geographical rush hour that the ravines in the lake's raised shoreline were carved and the building of the bar halted. So the bar was created by these massive winds blowing the sand, or blowing up these sand dunes, and then the bar was, when the water drained away, that was the end of the creation of the bar. Anyways, so the bar became a finished work, as finished as any physical feature of the landscape can be in the story. As the waters receded, the bar was revealed, emerging into view, high and dry, lying where no wave or current could reach or shape it for now. But that's the thing about the landscape. It looks so permanent and stable, yet it's also tentative, a work in progress. And I'll read one other thing that he, he also discovered. So apparently, uh, Lieutenant Governor Simcoe visited that around 19, 1796, and, and he visited this fellow named Beasley. Some of you guys might know who Beasley is. And uh, a couple of quotes that he, uh, John found. When we had crossed, when we had near crossed the bay, Beasley House became a very pretty object. We landed at it and walked up the hill. And then he later observed, which is interesting, the, the hill is quite like a park, fine turf with large oak trees disturbed, but no underwood. And I love that term underwood. It's, we, we say understory now, but I like the term underwood. Um, we walked two miles on this park, which is quite natural for no settlements near it, et cetera. So that's uh, Plains Road now, right? Where it was, it was actually Oak Savanna. Uh, the sand, dry, sandy area favored the growth of oak savanna, um, whereas other you know, trees, for, our, for example, may not have been favored there. Anyways, it was a great read, and it's, and it's fun, really fun, so I highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, and it left behind this amazing feature. So there's one aerial. Uh, Dr. Galbraith um, had a photo of this. It, that, sh that shoreline is what helped shelters uh, Coots Paradise and uh, wonderful Royal Botanical Gardens. Um, it also played a role in, in the War of 1812. It was a high uh, place where you could uh, defend a local area. There's a, a plaque there you can go visit. And there's another view um, from, from the east. And uh, yeah, it's quite significant. Then it became, again, uh, a, a route for roads, you know, originally portages, trails, roads, highways, bridges, railways, etc. So uh, yeah, and I missed the opportunity. There was, some, there was a big celebration on the bridge, I think, at one point in the bar somewhere over the last year or so, and it sounded really fascinating. I hope they do that again. I think they closed off the bridge and everything. It's sort of done. So now we're rounding the corner, heading to the east, and uh, Ronnie Provincial Park, Ronnie Creek Provincial Park is right on the shoreline, sort of on above the shoreline, with the shoreline being right at its edge. But I put this in, not because it's in the Lake Iroquois Plain, but to, to Kind of pay homage to the agriculture that had once also been in the area beyond the indigenous agriculture. Uh, there were so many farms in the Lake Iroquois Plain. It was fertile, it was warm, it was well-drained, clay and sand soils. Uh, 
in uh, Chapman and Putnam, he raised about thousands of family farms that were all part of that Lake Huron Plain in, in history. Uh, much of that is gone now from the GTHA, uh, but still remains uh, in in you know Niagara from a you know certain specialty crops, but also uh, further east in Northumberland and beyond. And there are remnants that you can find, uh, bits and pieces. Uh, and I, I, I know there are folks fascinated with trying to put together an uh, idea of a, maybe a trail that connects all of these, but there's one called Indian Ridge Trail uh, near Oakville. Um, this, this is what you see near Oakville in terms of where the shoreline is. That dark area, the uh, wooded area beyond the hydro pole to the right, uh, that's actually Lake Iroquois Shoreline Woods. City of Oakville, and that's Oak Savannah. It has been Oak Savannah. There's sassafras there, Oak Hickory. Again, uh, doing well on those uh, sandy, sandy soil, sandy uh, deposits. Uh, Iroquois Road. There's a hill further to the east. There's Iroquois Ridge Tire and Auto, where people get a good deal at the till. And the, the shoreline, as people develop, you know, the area was developed, and the actual shoreline was a help kind of hem in development because it was so difficult to get up to the top. Uh, but when people did build up there, it became the place to look down on others. It became a site for giant mansions, et cetera, and condos of to this day. But uh, there's still lots of remnants of natural features along that shoreline. Sometimes people build right into it here, but there also are pocket parks uh, and often again, reflecting the fact that these drier sites favored oak species and so on. And actually, there's some great oak savanna restoration, tall grass prairie oak restoration right along that shoreline as well. So again, a number of these trails and so on, and I'm, I, I'm fascinated with trying to piece it together. And one day within the next year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a cycle trip around the entire shoreline, tying together all these little bits and pieces. Well, here's, here's, our, here's our man. This is sort of the level of uh, Lake Iroquois at the time would have... Uh, would, would have kind of made it, you know, flooded most of the, the downtown of the city, et cetera. Uh, here's Chapman and Putnam's view of the Toronto area, uh, Toronto in the, south, in the southwest there. Um, so zoom in a little bit to High Park. High Park was in that shoreline and it was a sand plain associated with the Great Lake Iroquois Plain and the tall grass prairie oak savanna again, uh, very favored in that area. And they do done such a great job restoring it. I still, can't believe to this very day they get away with so many prescribed burns in downtown Toronto. Amazing job of, of telling us the story of the science and also the, you know, the, the uh, indication that decided to help make this happen. Amazing work, amazing work. As I mentioned though, it's you know, the, the old shoreline is just like the current shoreline just further inland. And here's a really great example. Um, up in the Humber River area, there's a uh, look to the north and west. Uh, there's a great old sandbar. That would have been a big lagoon there. And if you go to Darlington Provincial Park, there's the exact, you know, not exactly, very similar feature. There is a sandbar around Lake Ontario with the bay in behind. So the same process is, you know, underway then, or underway currently um, on the Lake Ontario shoreline right now. Uh, there's some great um, staircases and so on. Uh, there's things called Jane's Walk. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, where uh, local community members guide people around to interesting features in their neighborhood. And there's one that's focused just on the ups and downs of these uh, great staircases on the Lake Iroquois shoreline. The most famous feature though, probably for most people is Castle Loma. And I know relatives in Ireland who knew about the shoreline because they went to this site and saw a sign about the Lake Iroquois shoreline at the time, which is interesting. But that's that when it was first created, um, here it is today, uh, this day, and that's the view over top of, and it would have been when it first built, built far less developed, but it certainly was looking down at the city. But 13,000 years ago, it would have been a waterfront view, for example. And there our guy is here. I think those two other things are mastodons, you know, swimming in the sea. Um, and just recently during COVID, I, I got an email from somebody who has another project and he's documenting every location he can photograph of where the shoreline shows up. And I think John has done that, and John Terpstra has done that in the Hamilton area. Wherever it shows up in a roadside somewhere, and he's documented that in the photographs. And I'll, I'll put a link in or get a information to you about it. You can go online and see all these places that he's pieced together one by one, uh, photographing uh, that shoreline in the urban area. And where he, 
I'm hoping to work with him and expand the sort of photographic project to take in the entire shoreline at some point. And that was near uh, Davenport Road. And Davenport Road itself was again one of these, they say it's probably the oldest road in Toronto because it was originally an indigenous uh, portage route that then became a, a road, etc. cetera. Um, and there's another interesting little side project related to the Davenport Road. It's, it's called the Davenportage. It's a group of, I kind of, they call them adventure explorers, uh, just yeah, interesting people uh, with great imaginations who portage from the Hubner River along this uh, old shoreline, along the old trail to the Don River. And I was fortunate to be invited to, to join them a number of years ago. And we, we do it every fall, portaging right down the Dav you know, Davenport Road, Spadina. Uh, and the looks we get are, are really fun and interesting. And it, it's just a great time. And we do have actually uh, elders and representatives from Mississaugas of the Credit to help uh, welcome us uh, and to help make that connection and pay homage to the First Nations, Indigenous people who are so important to the story. Um, yeah, and, and we portage a bunch of food and bring it to the food bank. Anyway, lots of fun. You can probably Google that if you like. And then over to Scarborough Bluffs. Now that was, this is probably the only place left where the Lake Iroquois shoreline, which is very top of that bluff on the right-hand side, is actually overlooking water. Every, every, all other places, it's all down uh, inland. So that's sort of the level that the lake would have been at, and that would have been the old shoreline area. And then it dropped, and that's what was exposed. If you look on the left to see the name of the, the artist, that's A.J. Coleman. He's had a, a beautiful, you know, had beautiful uh, watercolor paintings of wherever he went. He, did, he went other places in the country as well. But this is the old Scarborough Bluffs and it's one of his great watercolors, which is quite neat. So I think I'll send this guy flying and the water drained away and so did he. Uh, so one other um, person who's done a lot of work on this is Nick Isles uh, from the University of Toronto, a geologist. He wrote books like Rock Ontario, um, Ontario Rocks or something, but he, he does a great job of interpreting uh, geology. I have a feeling he may have talked to the club at some point. If not, I highly recommend him. Um, short, the Lake Iroquois shoreline, it was kind of, it was like, it was the place to go for sand and gravel. You could just drive up to the shoreline and dig the stuff out and haul it away. So a lot of uh, the early development in the GTHA uh, would have, the aggregate would have come from that shoreline. Here's an example, you just, you know, carve it up, dig it away, and away you go. Nick's, Nick Isle's map here shows historic um, gravel pits, sand pits, and also uh, dumps, landfills. So a lot of these pits became landfill sites. We mapped them all. And it just shows how closely tied the use of those aggregates were to that shoreline. So in a way, if we had been, uh, if it was a different time, this would probably have been treated the same way we're treating the Oak Ridge's Moraine as a place that needed protection and, and better management. So it wasn't quite so, uh, uh, I guess, scoured away. Here's another example of a, a creek. I think it's in Sutton area, south of Uxbridge, where I, where I live. Um, and you know, again, these uh, staircases go up and down the, the, uh, the bluff. Uh, Heber Down is another place where there's a shore bluff uh, at the Cloca property. I skied down the shoreline here, just so I could say that I skied down the shoreline. Uh, Stevens Gulch, another one of these out of the way places. I'm not, I'm not sure if you ever heard of it, but it's one of those barrier beaches that was left behind like I showed you in the Humber. Uh, real beautiful landscape, but really distinctive. And it was all tied to, the, to that old shoreline area. Further to the east, uh, this is an earth science area of natural scientific interest. It was a map to help recognize some of these old shoreline features around islands. These are all islands in the Port Hope area. Um, and you can drive over there and see some of these bluffs and so on that were left behind when, or that were created when the waves were washing up against them you know, so many thousands of years ago. So here's one of those hillsides, for example. I think they'll send this guy free, freewheeling, freestyling. And then into Northumberland County, probably the least developed of all the Lake Iroquois Plain landscapes in Southern Ontario. And uh, there's lots of agriculture as well, uh, but not nearly as intensive and say as Niagara area uh, and lots of opportunity for, for some interesting conservation. So I could say there are some similar um, opportunities here. And I did speak to the professor from Brock and he 
uh, he was had been talking to a lot of people on the North Shore uh, in this Lake Iroquois Plain because the opportunities for agriculture, he said, are, are almost identical to those in Niagara region. Uh, and more and more that's being taken advantage of the, these conditions. But there's also still lots of wild spaces. Oh, there's also the Big Apple. If you've ever driven by uh, the Brighton area, you see the Big Apple. It used to not have these googly eyes on it, and the new owners came in and they painted these eyeballs on them. And it's, it's a big tourist trap. You can buy pies and all kinds of stuff there, cider, et cetera. Um, so I recommend dropping in. It's, it's worth the trip if you have kids, et cetera. Good for uh, petting zoo, the whole shebang. However, they, these eyeballs, actually you can climb up into this and get to the very top of that apple, F, it, FYI. These eyeballs are looking right across Highway 401 at the shoreline. And that's the size of the shoreline in that Northumberland County area. The, the height of this is very different than the height of the shoreline, say, in Niagara Peninsula. And I'll, I'll let you think about why that is. So this is further to the east, a lot further east, and the shoreline is much higher relative to what it is in, say, the Niagara region. So I'll come back to that. And remind me if I've forgotten to, to talk about that, but think, think about that. All right, so we've made it around to the point where we've got this big blob in the north uh, of north, north of Lake Ontario. Uh, it's called the Trent Embayment. It was just another bay of, of, the, of the lake at the time. And in that, in that, you see the big blue area in the middle? Uh, the dark is actually uh, oh, organic soils or gigantic wetland there called Murray Marsh. Uh, so this was all part of the, the lake and all these drumlins, a lot of them were islands. So it's like this big you know, archipelago of islands in that area. You can visit that. This is a, a lookout, he, uh, Heber, I think I have a slide of it. It's actually a lookout spot. You can climb up and look across what once would have been an ancient lake with these sort of islands left behind. There he is, he's, he's having a little shore camp here. Lake drains away and then that's left behind. I think I have a picture, Sager, Sager Conservation Area. Yeah, beautiful lookout uh, north of Belleville and you really can get a sense of what that landscape's like when we're going to visit there. So now, uh, where are we now? Okay, yeah, we're still north of 401 or sometimes along the 401, sometimes it di dives south. And now we're over into Prince Edward County. So on the bottom of the slide, a place called Picton, um, not far from the ferry that goes across towards the Kingston area. And if you draw your attention to the north, circled there, and then zooming in, see these etchings, and you saw some of that in the film. These are actually scours of icebergs. So icebergs were, were moving around the lake. Again, it would be strong, strong winds, and icebergs scraped the till was, that was beneath it in the lake bottom. And to this very day, the change in soil structure and, and uh, drainage has had vegetation patterns remain reflecting those striations today. So that's one of the areas I'm working in and we're trying to find places where we can protect that and keep that in place. I know there's, there's solar developments and things happening there. So we're looking at finding ways to, to, to protect that feature. Uh, there's bound to be interesting plants and things growing in there as well. Anyways, even over in Prince Edward County, there's that history. So just to kind of wrap up a bit on the conservation side, um, we know that these, the area between the Lake Iroquois shoreline and the Lake Ontario shoreline is highly significant, highly productive. And one of the most important features is uh, that of migratory bird stopover habitat. Um, we, we know so much more about migration now than I did before. There was a project, I'm not sure if I have a slide of that. Yeah, on the US side, um, they mapped using volunteers and professional ornithologists, uh, bird um, numbers during migration. And they didn't ask birders to just give us their observations. They directed birders to go to specific locations. They stationed them in a grid pattern practically uh, across the, the, the New York side of the Lake Ontario shoreline, Lake Iroquois Plain as well. And they found, yeah, there's always hot spots. There's always a Thixon's wood, which is what we got here in the middle, uh, big wetlands, etc. But even the small scraps of woods nestled into the middle of a, a industrial park were tremendously important numbers, huge number of birds in these areas because these shorelines during spring and fall were, were their sort of landing spot uh, for them to rest and feed and so on. Um, and many of you have been to Thixon's Woods, one of the best birding spots in that part of the world. Um, so market bird stopover habitat is tremendously important in the Lake Iroquois Plain. One of the reasons why it brought that landscape up so high in that assessment was done earlier. Even a place like Darlington Provincial Park, which is a great recreational park, kind of a introductory park for camping for people, but a you know, little scrap of a park 
still tremendously, tremendously important. Another other, um, ecological benefits and features related to the landscape is there's lots of groundwater uh, resources associated with the shoreline. So wells that are, have been dug into the sand plain and so on and benefit from the water that is coming through the shoreline. Um, and there's a lot of groundwater discharge right at the base of that of the shore. And streams that come in, say from the Oak Ridges Moraine, a cold water stream goes through open agricultural land, warms up, they go through the shoreline and cold water drains out into them and it gets cold again. So cold water fish species um, like brook trout, et cetera, even a red side dace, for example, are below the shoreline because it's being fed by the cold water coming out of that the shore, which is really kind of a neat, neat aspect. Um, and, and these wetlands I mentioned before, the, these the water seeping out of the base of the shoreline creates these sort of wet areas. This is one that was mapped in the Central Lake Ontario area. It's a big complex of, of wetland and all, a lot of the area in between these polygons are actually developed, but the wetland here is, is quite significant when you piece it all together. Here, here's one, one example of that. And one of the other few wildlife uh, shots I have, in there, there are very few things that are very specific to the Lake Ontario shoreline or Lake Iroquois shoreline, I should say, but one is bank swallows. So according to uh, Chris from the Canadian Wildlife Service, no, no, Mike, what's his name, Mike? Oh, I'm trying to blank. Some of you may know him. He, he did some work on bank swallows and a lot of these, uh, and here's one of their nest sites, for example, where the water, uh, the streams come through the Lake Iroquois shoreline, creating these bluffs, are one of the few natural spots, and also like on the Lake Ontario shoreline, where bank swallows nest in natural locations. So many of the places that they're monitoring are aggregate pits that are managed and monitored very closely to uh, either protect these birds or find ways that they're not attracted to active uh, pits, for example, active faces of these old aggregate pits. But the actual shoreline itself uh, is known to be a, a, a kind of a concentration spot for, for bank swallows, which is pretty neat. Um, now, from a conservation perspective, there has been a lot of focus on the shoreline until recently. It always shows up, if you look in Natural Heritage Book, it always shows up as, as a feature. Uh, but there has been a lot of focus on, on what it um, contributes in terms of natural heritage. Uh, Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority, though, created a Lake Iroquois Beach securement strategy where they're trying to protect parts of it and, and create this connected, maintain this connected corridor. I know the Kootztee Escarpment people have, are very aware of, of that shoreline and how it kind of contributes um, natural to natural heritage in the area. And uh, the, even the Greenbelt plan had, hadn't really focused a lot on it, but when they looked at possible expansion in 2015, they did look at expanding into further, air, further areas in Lake Iroquois Plain. So look at in the east side, for example, Northumberland, all that blue area, you'd recognize that as mostly Lake Iroquois Plain and that Trenton Bayman that had all these particular special features identified in this assessment of being significant. Uh, and they ex examined that for possible expansion. So back in 2015, it was proposed, but it didn't get traction. There just wasn't the community support for it where it was in some of these other locations of the Greenbelt. But now, it's being looked at again. So there, the government has put forward ideas for a you know, proposal for potential expansion where there's community support, where there's science behind it, et cetera. And it's coming back again as a consideration anyways. And as I mentioned, um, we have uh, what we call natural area conservation plans in the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And that targets our land securement, land stewardship work and our partnership work, working in the broader landscape. And we, our first plan in the area, actually first plan in country, was below Rice Lake. Rice Lake is that long skinny lake in sort of middle of the photo. And the blob to the north, the below of that, brown and cir circled in green mostly, was Lake Rice Lake Plains, which is an area of tall grass prairie, oak savanna on top of the Oak Ridges Marine. We recently reviewed our plan and took a much broader um, perspective on the landscape and places that we felt were important to work. And we got, we, said, yes, the Lake Iroquois Plain needs more attention and is now is included in this plan. And we have a very specific focus on conservation work in the Lake Iroquois Plain. And I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled to be working down there. One of the reasons that up high and dry in the Oak Ridge and Marine where there's not a lot of people, we, it, it 
we need to help people learn about the conservation issues there, the threat and the amazing biodiversity and bring people up there to see it. When you're working in Lake Iroquois Plain, you're working in people's backyards and they get the, the importance of protected natural heritage so close to them, especially now, now with COVID, people are realizing how important local natural areas are. So I'm really thrilled to be able to work in this landscape uh, and, and help uh, make a difference uh, for some of the, the, the habitats there for sure. Here's one, for example, near Wesleyville, which is so you'll see the Wesleyville exit off the 401, uh, just to the e e west of Port Hope. Uh, lots of natural areas there, beautiful shoreline. You know, once look, this is a map or a, or artistic rendition of the forest that was once there. Uh, there's still remnants of forest there and some old growth forest in, in some of the ravines that were left behind after the, the Lake Iroquois drained away, for example. And there's local community groups that were teaming up with to try and do some conservation work down in that part of the world. So here again, it's a view of a shoreline. That's a Coburg area where the Wesleyville is just further to the west. And that's another, another look at that there. So now, as we have done in the past, um, we're, we're, we're working with community groups to find ways to support conservation work of others, and then also for us to engage very directly in land securement and stewardship down the road. And you know, the, a lot of Lake uh, Waterfront Trail actually follows pieces of that Lake Iroquois shoreline. And Lake Iroquois Plain has lots of opportunities to visit. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you on my bicycle passing through Hamilton someday. So with that, I'll send this fellow off into the sunset and say thanks so much for, for listening and watching. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it and got to see your piece, how your piece of the puzzle of the Lake Iroquois shoreline fits into the bigger picture and maybe inspired you to do some more exploration of your own. So thanks very much. I'm going to unshare this. No, I want to keep this on, right, Chris? And I think there will be an opportunity for question and answer. Yes, yeah, just bring up your Q&A and you'll see there's a few in there. This is again at Bonhead Bluff. If you haven't been there, you'll, yeah, it's, it's a tremendous spot. Actually, right on the shoreline, there are some significant plant species, and I'm trying to remember the names of some of them, but there are reports uh, done by a fellow named Wazel Bukowski, who works at the Natural Heritage Information Center with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, and, they, and they found a very interesting plant species right at the base of the shoreline uh, and some of the eroded kind of, because this is a very active bluff. I'm not sure if you heard a little while ago, the big landslide at the Scarborough Bluffs. Um, so we're all very active there. So that I think maybe partly those kind of dynamic soils are something that are favored by some of these other plants. Anyways, I, I might I might just be quiet for a second, Chris, and you can ask, ask a question. Okay. This one from Sheldon McGregor at the at the end. Uh, can you reshow the map and show the shoreline as a red line, please? Okay. If you can remember what that one was. Tell me no. The larger one of or, or you want me to focus on uh, the Hamilton area. Which area was that, Sheldon? We're talking about. I suppose there's a quicker way to do this, but mm. in summary, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> backwards. Okay, how about that one? Uh, it was on early, it was early on and on Lake Ontario. This one? He's waiting for his answer. Yeah, I can't see the Q and A, Chris. No, nope, that's not the one. Yeah. Yeah, he's the okay. second question down, but he's adding more at the bottom. So down at the bottom there. Uh, maybe it's possible to get later. Yeah, maybe we can look for it after. Okay, thanks, Sheldon. Okay, next one is from Susan Stram. The map that shows the soil types, clay, sandy, etc. Could we have a link to it? Is is it online? Yeah, you should find it online. Chapman and Putnam, Physiography of Southern Ontario. 
and that's actually uh, these. I didn't scan these myself. I think I or maybe I did. I mean, maybe I did scan those. But um, yeah, you could should be able to find it online. The book is hard to find. Actually, it's out of print, and mm. it's got a huge hard copy map, which is really spectacular. Um, but like, like I've got, I can share share these slides, for example. So if I can, if you want, I can share those. And well, yeah. Um, can do that, or the uh, this is also being recorded, so they can look at the video again and just get. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, great. Get that way, so they can get their information that way. So I think you have you have his, their book name in here somewhere. Yeah, show the book. So. Yeah, physiography, physiography of Southern Ontario, Chapman and Putnam, nineteen eighty four. Okay, and so it's a fantastic book. She also says, John Chapshaw falling into place, Gasparo Press. Oh, very okay. good. Excellent. Yeah. Good, good. Thanks, Susan. Yes. And word word, that's um there's a mask on it now. Hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, right. that. <laughs> that's good. That's so true. That's really it's a mask on the big apple. Okay. Yeah, the they actually if you go inside the apple, there's actually uh, interpretive displays. So my dream is to get this story told in some of those interpretive displays as well there. So oh, see. good. Yeah. Pretty neat. Okay, Sheldon again, also the Northumberland County aerial photo just before you moved to PEC. Huh. Northumberland County? Yes. It was a, it was an air photo they said yeah county aerial photo just before you moved to pec not sure what you mean by that hmm. oh i see yeah sorry about that now i know you're talking about this one okay good let's see what sheldon says oh dang dang sorry <laughs> sorry about that. oh dear i'll go back Oh yeah, if you want to show that, shift F5 to show us an individual slide. I did F5 and it went right to the beginning of the slide. So. Yeah, shift F5 does the current slide. Oh, shift F5. Oh, I'm learning yeah. so many things. Okay, here we go. Oh gosh, this is so amazing. Thank you for these tips. You're welcome. Yeah, I don't see anything else from Sheldon. We can go back to that one too and do the other one. So, okay, that's okay, Sheldon. Okay, Janice, you never circled back to the east shore higher than the south. Okay, so what, is, what does she think the answer is? Hey, Janice, do you have an answer to that one? Why it's higher? Just waiting for her to put an answer in. And it, it, it didn't make sense to me at first, but it, but it did soon after. Is she, yeah, is she okay. something? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Oh. Okay, well, the water so was flowing south. Yeah, so in the, uh, in the film, you saw how uh, the glaciers were so thick that it compressed the land mm -hmm. and it was much thicker and on the ground for much longer further east than it was further west. So uh, mm -hmm. it's just sort of more of a toe of a glacier and less, less depth anyways in the, in the Hamilton Niagara area. And it was much deeper and for, there for much longer in the east. So as the glacier disappeared, it rebounded much more quickly in the east. So it's, uh, it's tilting because the land is rising, it's compressed more, and then it is now rising more. So it's doing this tilting because the land has rebounded much more in that direction. Uh -huh. and, and it's still rising to this day. There's still a pivot um, of that shoreline. I forget how many like millimeters or something per year. Right. But uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's why. And uh, yeah, and I first thought, okay, it was gone longer from the Hamilton Niagara area would have been rebounding a lot, you know, for a lot longer period of time. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't nearly depressed as much than in that that region as it was for the east. So the rebound is much bigger for the east. So it's it's really distinct. Remember you saw that picture in Niagara, that little bluff compared to that. Uh, so it's really uh, really kind of neat to see be able to see that. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Okay, Bruce and Lori, um, does that answer your question, Bruce, as well? That. Uh, you so said you mentioned the shoreline is higher in the east compared to Niagara. I think that's that's the explanation, is it, or is something different? I think that was what they were looking for. Same thing, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, Dean, this is very informative talk. Thank you, Sheldon. Again, it was okay. We got that. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, it's up right now. Okay, so you got that. Get through them. Okay. Uh, Ben's got a link to Geology Ontario, MD, MND. Uh, yeah. Yeah, got my Ontario and imaging. Okay, let me just something that's probably what we're referring to. Uh, you can find the book online through various universities. Oh, that's good. Oh, there great. You. There you go. Okay, Susan Ben, thanks. Jackson, great talk, Mark. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. What still excites you about uncovering the story of this lake? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, I guess it's, I, I think, I, I, I guess I'm kind of spilling my guts here a little bit. As a naturalist, I kind of like that we get things that people don't and then mm. people learn about them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we, we get fascinated by the landscape and, and uh, birds, plants, and people just walk by these things. And until yeah. you tell them, help them learn about it, they don't appreciate it. So you know, in COVID, so many more people are knowing, learning about our local natural areas. And besides doing their first little walkabout, they're going there again and again. And they say, wow, I never knew this was here. What is this? What is that? So yeah. part of it was to just help people learn about this landscape that like millions of people live in and they don't really know the story. Um, but then the other part of it is, is a conservation um, objective too. So uh, I think the, the more me, people know how significant it is, uh, the more support there may be for protection. You know, there's a, there's, we, you know, NCC doesn't get into politics of lobbying for political change, um, but the green belt, the opportunity to protect more in the green belt through the green belt in this area is really uh, significant. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, if people are armed with more information about significance of things, uh, I think they uh, enjoy the area more, appreciate it more, but I think it could lead to a greater degree of conservation as well. Right, yeah, That's, that makes sense. That's great. Okay, uh, what else we have here? Um, <clears throat> okay, that's that. Okay, Mark Beckett, the Great Lakes have had changes in water levels. Has this made it difficult to outline the Iroquois Plain? Hmm. Um, I guess what, I'll, what, one thing I'll just mention, there were there were different levels. So um, if you go to the, actually, I think there's a book on the Red, Cre Red Hill Creek. Oh, yeah. And that, that tells an amazing story of the shoreline and the different levels of the lake that, that I'm just showing one level. So there were different levels of the lake at the time. And then when it rained, it was a much lower lake. And I think they called it Lake Frontenac or something. So there are all just various levels at that even back then. Um, I think, oh gosh, I have a great link. I just found it not too long ago. And I'll have to send it to you, Chris. And I can't, okay. can't think I can pull it up right now. But they map this, they map the shoreline using LIDAR, which is a, a new type of aerial photography, with radar or something. And, uh, and, and using a mathematical equations about the degree of rebound and, and various things. They've mapped it exquisitely. It's just so detailed. And oh, wow. what's really neat is that he was able to confirm, they, they, the team, were able to confirm, you know, some of Coleman's pinpoint marks on the map. You know, they said oh, and they, wow, really? in their own way, right? So I don't think I've answered your question about contemporary water level changes and how, how, how to how it affect how it could be mapped. But there is this really new map that I'll have to send it to, to Chris and, and you can share it with others. Yeah, it's, it, it blew my mind when I saw it. It was just amazing. Oh, that's neat. Okay. So much stuff out there. It's amazing. Okay. In regards to the question from saying the east is higher than Niagara, um, one comment here is isostatic rebound. Yeah. That's the term. I should have used that term. Right. And there you could, go. Good answer, Bruce. Yeah. Could have used two words and instead I used four sentences. <laughs> that's me. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, we got it either way. That's good. Okay, Mark is asking again, is the development of the uh, the plain areas making it more difficult to identify the plain? Oh, um, no, I think like the, the, the geology is is there. Anything below the Lake Iroquois shoreline to the lake is all Lake Iroquois plain. And then there's clay plain, there's sand plain. But the, uh, that's actually the landscape itself. So really it's anything between the, the shoreline, the big bathtub ring, and the Lake Ontario shoreline is considered Lake Iroquois Plain. Mm -hmm. right. Does that answer the question? Uh, I think so. We'll have to see what Mark says, but just uh, say yes if it does, Mark. 
it's yeah it's hard, certainly for people to kind of understand the land form when it's buried by con concrete and and subdivision that sort of thing but there are places though where you can you know i i'm just dying to knock on somebody's door you know after covid can i come up to your balcony and take a picture because some of them have just a spectacular view yeah. east or west right along that shoreline and just amazing you know you can tell yeah. you see it oh that'd be really something yeah that'd be a good uh, <clears throat> compilation of things like that that'd be really good mm -hmm. okay tom from coots to escarpment ecosystem park recent work relevant to this talk on building near urban nature network in mm. our neck of the woods the southern ontario coalition and he's got a link here for the green belts near nature near urban nature project so maybe something yes. to look out for there yeah actually and uh, i'm not sure who, who put that in but i i we've been connected with that um yeah. we've been talking to the green belt foundation and things like that and th these are some really good examples are some of these pocket parks and things in in and in, in the lake iroquois plain yeah so we're are having some discussions of trying to get, provide more information for people who might be interested in, in promoting some of those opportunities. Well, that's great. Yeah, we'll send them along and we can, I can put them in the newsletter and just updates and that'd be fine. Sure, sure. We do a monthly one. Yeah, that was from Tom at Coots to Escarpment Echo Park System. I'm oh, sure good, cool. Tom well, hello, Tom. Right right Thanks for joining. Thanks okay. for joining. Okay, yeah. Uh, Mark gets back and says, yes, very interesting presentation. Thanks. Um, and Bruce and Laurie are asking, where is the present map showing? So one you have on the screen right now. Oh, okay. Bottom right is Presque Isle Park. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, okay. And uh, let's see to the right. We part. Oh no, yeah, Prince Presque Isle Park, Brighton, and then that big blob in the southwest is Lakeport. It's a big uh, oh. gravity operation. Okay. Great. Well, that's fabulous, Mark. That's it for the questions. You got a lot of thanks in there. I really appreciate it. A lot of great interest. That's. I think a lot of people are going to be looking around differently now and checking things out and looking for other signs of what's going on around them. Oh, look, oh, now I, 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 sorry, I just opened up the Q&A. So thanks everybody for the, for the compliments and the nice, uh, nice words, appreciate it. Okay, yeah, well, thank you for presenting this. It was great to have you and I have to get you back sometime when you get more info or something else, so. All right, and uh, make sure everybody goes to visit National Film Board. You, you know, you'll never, yes. never look back. That's <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, especially you can get that, that for free, so that's good, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, so much, Mark. Thanks for having me. Okay. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Good everybody. Night. Have Take a care. great summer. We'll see you in September or next week at the bird study if you're going to that. Okay, Take care. Safe. Yeah. You too. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. Wear a mask. <laughs>